Hello, I'm just adjusting this, make it look a little better. Good, uh, that's reasonable. Uh, welcome to our weekly Pasha Shear with the commentary of the al Uh This week's Shear is sponsored once again by an old friend of mine, Shimon Fraze. And it's uh, for the yurt site of his daddy and his father in 24th Shvat. And that is uh, Shimon Zaman Bes Ben Eliyahu. Shimon Zaman Ben Eliyahu should his neshama should have an Leah, and uh, the discussing of the shear should contribute towards that. Uh, if you would like to uh, sponsor the shear for uh, a yurt site or to celebrate a simcha, an engagement, or mitzvah, then please let us know. Let me know here. I I'm trying to get the lighting right, so I'm going to do some changing. Ooh, as we talk at this very moment. Uh, and hopefully that'll be a little bit better. Yeah, I don't look quite so bleached. Well, reasonably bleached. Um, anyway, I, I have a special light which died. Um, I won't tell you how it died, but it died. And so by doing a little bit of changing, yeah, that's the way I look. A bit like a cherry. Okay, there's nothing I can do about that. Anyway, let's get down to the Parsha and the, the comment of the al -Shuk. Uh, this week's Sedra is the Pasha of Mishpotim. The Pasha's Mishpotim, Pasha's Mishpotim has um, almost, no, actually not, but uh, has a huge number of mitzvahs in it. One of the largest uh, uh, number of uh, uh, tally of mitzvahs in the whole of all the, the Parshas in the Torah. And, um, and, and if you're interested, uh, the number is 53. That is uh, 23 don't it uh, do's and 30 don'ts there's always more don'ts in the tower than do's um 365 don'ts one for each day of the year 248 do's um so it seems to be in life more uh more danger of uh things you might do that you shouldn't do uh, so anyway so that's that with that as an introduction um we have to with so much to investigate to look at and of course, through the eyes of the Alshech, I'm sure you'll understand that 53 mitzvahs is a, a little bit much. I, I think I wanted to say, when I was thinking about the Shia earlier in the week, that the Alshech of Kodesh is on the, on the, on the Chumash, even in Parshish Mishpotim, the Mar Parshish Mishpotim, if you look at it, is overwhelmingly the basis for the laws of tort damage uh, in, the, in the Halacha, in the Talmud. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, you would expect the Alshach to um, really uh, extend himself uh, to go in a in a hal in a halachi direction, particularly as he was the Avbeisin of Svas. So Rabbi Yosekaro, who gave him smicha, I mean Rabbi Yosekaro wrote the Shulchan Aruch. I would imagine he was the he was the halachic authority, but his Talmud, the Alshach Kodesh, was the Avbeisin of Svas at a time of the golden age of Svas, and there is plenty that he could have said. I can see halakhically if I just, for dramatic effect, I'm moving back, particularly for those who sometimes write and say, is this a, a, a backdrop, a computer de a generated backdrop you have here? Ah, I say, um, watch this. Can you do this from a backdrop? This is that color. This safer here, if I bring it forward, is Maram Ham al -Shuk. And these little letters here, Shin, Vov, Sof, Shailas, the Shuvas, the questions, the halakhic questions that people write to rabbis are called Shailas, questions, Shuvas, and their answers. And here are the collected Shailas and Shuvas, I'm sure there was, there was many, many, many more, of the Alshach. And of course, being an Alshach a devotee, it's a delight to see his halakhic genius. Uh, however, he doesn't bring his halakhic genius uh, I mean, at the background, he knows the halakhic context, but he doesn't, in his parish on the Chumash that we study every week, he doesn't go in that direction. It's it's what's called drash, or drush, um, when he is looking at the midrashic uh, aspects of the Torah. So even though the Parshish Mishpotim could leave him to, as it were, wrote, write another book uh, based on the halakhic aspects of the Parsha, with uh, 53 halachas to discuss, he, he uh, confines himself to discussing the drush. And that's what we're going to do as well. Okay, so there's so much to choose from. What to choose? 
Um, so in this week's um, uh, uh, Alshik Shea, we're going to quote, we're going to look not only at the Alshik, but um, somebody who came after him, also of the, also the Sephardi tradition, uh, and that is the Ramchal, the Majakhan and Sata. Uh, we're also going to look at um, uh, somebody who was not a Sephardi, um, Simcha Zissel, the founder of Yeshiva of Kelm, in the Sefer Chochman Musa. I was also going to be looking at uh, one of my rabbis, Rabata, eh, sorry, Rabata, Ramata Seal Solomon um, Shlita, um, and see what he has to say on the subject. And if I get anything else here in my little pile of pre preparations, oh, yes, um, I've also got uh, here, oh, I just bring this up, a sefer called Me'ain Beis Shoeva by Rav Shimon Schwab. Well, I didn't have the the schools the merit of ever meeting, but his brother, I think it was his younger brother, Moshe Schwab, I had the great honor of being in his shear in Gates of the Shiva. It was the first shear I entered in Gates of the Shiva. He gave shear, the second shear, shear base, in Gates of the Shiva, which is where I was my was the entry level shear. And I that's where I started at the, at the at the bottom. And if you stay there long enough, you can claim to have got to the top. But it's uh, <clears throat> more chronological as a as opposed to a uh, a merit uh, claim, but you'll get the idea. Okay, having said all that, let's actually get down to Taklis. This is the commentary of Ramatasil Solomon, uh, one of my great rabbis, and Ramatasil Solomon uh, points to what it says at the beginning of Mr. Lishashar, the commentary of Ramatasil on Mr. Lishashar, one of my very, very favorites for him. In fact, I'm learning it again with Michael Prison. We're just coming to the end of, of this cycle. It's one of the critical forum for uh, uh, Jews from my tradition, the Lithuanian tradition, to, to master. And he, the, the whole Sefer is built on a Gomorrah and a Voidazurim, and it's in Davkov Omid Base. And this is where it says, it says, and this is, I say, so fundamental, if you've never come across, because I know that many people dip into the Shia who are re relatively new to Judaism, Masilis Hisharim is a classic. If you hear it quoted, you can simply simply say, ah, Repinkus ben Yor. So Repinkus ben Yor, one of the great rabbis of the Talmud, uh, has the following saying. And the, his following saying was the basis upon which this classic work was uh, was created. And now I'm just going to give you that saying, and I'm going to tell you later to something he says in his commentary, which was born of that saying. Mikan Omer Repinkus ben Yor. I have a grandson called Yori, by the way. Torah may be the day Zahirus. Torah brings you to something called Zahirus. Zahirus uh, is which is being careful in your performance uh, as a religious Jew. Zahirus may be the day Zahirus. And as I said before, when I was making the joke about more don'ts than do's in the Torah, then this is the um, if I remember rightly, this is the this is the do's and Zriz is in the don't. I think it's that way. As the heroes maybe the day, I have to read this, I have to learn this a few more cycles. Uh, the heroes maybe the day Zrizas, and Zrizas is um zealousy to be zealous, to be to be passionate. Passion is a better translation. Zrizas maybe the day Nikius, and Zrizas bring you to now in the English translations they say cleanliness. At that point, I just shake my head. Who translated as cleanliness? It means purity, making sure that your mitzvahs and your, your relationship with Hashem is pure. Um, the key is maybe the day precious, which brings you to precious separation from worldly things, that means. Precious maybe the day tahara, which brings you to purity. Um, tahara maybe the day chasidus, and that brings you to chasidus. And chasidus maybe the day anova, which brings you to humility. Anova may be the day Yeris Hachet, which leads you to fear of sin. And Yeris Hachet may be the day Kedusha, and that brings you to holiness. And Kedusha may be the day Ruach HaKadosh. And if you reach the level of Ruach HaKadosh, then it might bring you to, um, sorry, to, of, uh, of, of holiness. It might be Ruach HaKadosh when your ideas, your concept, your mind is so connected to Shemayim, to heaven, that you're indeed inspired and effectively a conduit uh, through which heaven can speak and pass on ideas. Ruach HaKadosh may be the day Tehiyas HaMesim, and if you reach that, then you're guaranteed Tehiyas HaMesim. Um, and that's the famous 
commentary of uh, our statement of repentance when you are upon which this book is 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 based and we're going to come back to that towards the end of the shear let's look at the al shaykh and we better start off by making sure we know what the al shaykh is going to be or what we're going to be addressing in the al shaykh and this is uh, a very very important uh, part of the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu at the end of Parshas and Potim is reported to go up to Mount Sinai uh, to speak to Hashem and he's, he is um, uh, accompanied by the Zakanim, the elders, the 70 elders and, and, uh, and others and he comes there and he says, well I'll read this to you. So who was there? I'll read it in English to speed it up so we've got more time for the, for the Alshak. Moshe Aaron Lord of Nabihu Interesting, Moshe Aaron and Nod of Nabihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel ascended. So they saw, and this is the critical bit, they saw Hashem, they saw Hashem, they saw Hashem, they saw Hashem, the Rabban Shalom, Almighty Himself. And underneath his, his feet, it says, um, which is problematic, he doesn't have feet. You need a body to a feet. The Shem is not uh, corporeal, it is not physical. And um, the God of Israel under his feet, but that's the translation, was the likeness of sapphire brickwork. Sapphire brickwork. Okay, so bricks, apparently the floor had something, tiles, bricks of sapphire, the beautiful blue uh, precious stone sapphire. And it was like the, es uh, the essence of, the, of heaven and its purity. Fine. Okay. Now that's the, the story. That's what we're going to focus on the al -Shukh. So the al here, and we're going to come back to that shortly, says he's, he's not got a huge number of questions here, um, but even still, I'm, I'm cutting it down to just one or two for us in our shear. So he says, Ra'al Asimli, we should really consider the passage that we just read, when it talks about God, the vision of God that these people saw, and they saw under his feet was this, these uh, sapphire bricks, this is what is what, what does that mean? Sapphire brings. What's that talking about? If we're talking about is the sort of bricks that you use in order to build a structure, Maho Sapir. So why does it have to be made of sapphire? It is just bricks. And it is Rashi says there. Uh, what was it there for? In order to be a constant reminder to Hashem that the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt at that time uh, by bricks. They had to build structures for Pharaoh and the, they had to make the bricks, bake the bricks in a kiln or kilns, and then uh, use them to, to build the structures they were instructed to, to, to make. And if that's what it's talking about, if that's what they're talking about, obviously that's problematic. Hashem doesn't need an aid memoir. He doesn't have an alarm on his his, his clock, his, his wrist, wristwatch. Of course, he does a wristwatch anyway. For a wristwatch, he would require a wrist. Anyway, so that's question number two. Um, and Gimel, Lama Hodiyan Shiro is as a Kenim Gam in the Sapir. This business of the Sapir, so we talked about the bricks, it's a problem for bricks, but what's the Indian of Sapir? The Sapir, Samach. Pay yud resh is going to be very critical. It does mean sapphire, but we'll come back to that soon. So I'm going to close my alshak for the moment and take you in a slightly different direction, and then we'll go and see what the alshak has to say, which uh, I think you will enjoy. I certainly did enjoy looking at this earlier today. But first of all, let's consider this concept of it was there as a reminder. It says Rashi, you know, when Rashi says something, it's not, it's it's clever, and that's the understatement of the century or the millennium, perhaps. Rashi is the guide, uh, who is without whose guidance um, and leadership, we would not be able to in any way forge a path through the, the Chumash or indeed the Talmud. So when Rashi says something, you have to pay attention to it. And as I'm sure I've said before in the Shirim, when Rashi says something, it is not um, because he thought it was a nice thing to say or clever things to say. Rashi is quoting. Everything Rashi says is sourced in uh, primary Jewish sources, Chazal, in Midrashim, in Gomorrahs, in uh, the Agadita, the Midrashic parts of the Agada, 
and the Hilters, also, it's all in the classic works, which you can see in the real books, as I think I demonstrated before, or the backdrop uh, behind me. So when Rashi picks something from the words of Chazal to say, it's going to be very critical. So Rashi says it was there in order to remind Hashem of the suffering of the Jewish people. But obviously my, my question was, was a very relevant question. Hashem doesn't need a reminder. He doesn't need an aid memoir. So the, the question obviously is, what is Rashi meaning? What's, what's he getting at here? Now remember, any message, any vision that, that, that you see of Hashem is there to convey a message to the person seeing it. So when Moshe sees Hashem and he's wearing tefillin, for example, he sees a knot at the back, and there's a message with that, which we discussed in previous shirim, and I'll, I know I've probably told you this before, and you've heard it before, but from the uh, Biala Rebbe, a really brilliant insight. What did he see? He saw the tefillin with the knot at the back of the head. He only saw the knot on the back of Hashem's head. Remember, he doesn't have a head. It's just a vision to convey a message to the person seeing it. What was the message? You only see Hashem looking backwards looking behind. How many times in all of our lives have we, have we thought, have we said, when something has gone wrong in our lives, I thought it was the worst thing that could have possibly have happened. And then maybe a year, a month, it could be a week, a day even, uh, but a, certainly a year later you think, ah, the ah moment with the exclamation point, the exclamation mark. Ah, now I get it. Looking back, you don't get it. At the time you don't get it, but now it all fits, that piece of the, of the puzzle fits into place. Ah, you only see Hashem looking backwards. Sometimes we find ourselves in difficult moments, in difficult circumstances. We think, why is it Hashem doing this to us? But a year later, or maybe longer, it, the, the piece of the jigsaw fits into place. That's the general idea which we're going to be looking at here. That here, it is a message being shown with this vision that they see of Hashem with the, 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 uh, the floor of sapphire bricks. And basically, it's something that conveys a very important message. Now, there's another uh, a part of the same Parsha, our same Parsha, and that is when it's talking about um, if you lend people money. Now, as we all know, I'm sure, that in Jewish law, lending somebody money is a big mitzvah. And, of course, giving people money is a big mitzvah. We, are, we have a, a, a measure, a, a financial obligation which we have to fulfill, 10% of our disposable income has to go to charity. But to lend somebody money, that's also a mitzvah. And this is what the it famously says. Now, I've got to read this in the Hebrew because um, we'll lose too much if we translate it into English. In Kesav Salva Isami, if you, Jewish person, lend my people, not your people, my people, says Hashem, um, S -A -S -A, lend people money, or oh, the implication is money, doesn't say money. S -A -O -N -E -Moch, the poor person with you. Now, as we say many times uh, when we're learning the Al Shech, Hashem's good at Hebrew and he doesn't say oops. So if there's a word that doesn't seem that's missing that should be there to convey an idea, or something that's extra that doesn't need to be there to convey the idea, because Hashem doesn't say oops and he's good at Hebrew, then there has to be another reason why that word appears or fails to appear. So here we've got an extra word. Again, in Kesa Salva Sami, if you lend my people money, it's say only imoch, the poor person with you. Do you just say the poor person? If you lend my people money, the poor. Why well, say the poor person with you? And that I'm just going to see what the what the art school translates it because the Alsha usually disagrees. Uh, when you let, uh, lend my people money, the, the poor person who, who is with you. <laughs> Oh, conceive the who. Uh, do not act towards him. The next bit, then translate and just say that read in Hebrew. As a creditor, do not lay interest upon him. So you can't double expression right enough, but well, that's for another share. Um, you can't be a creditor and you can't lay interest on him. You must treat him gently. He mustn't uh, make his life a misery over repaying the debt. Conversely, if you borrowed the money, you should make your uh, sincerest efforts to make sure you do pay re repay the debt. But here we're addressing the creditor. Uh, not the debtor. So basically, uh, that's where it says. But the critical thing is, Ese Oni Imoch. Now, there's a beautiful Rashi here, a fabulous Rashi. Um, the Rashi I first saw, or rather, I paid attention to it through the, wor the words of Rip Simcoe Zissel, the founder of Kelm, 
And Rav Simba goes, this old, if I can let me just read this to you. This is, so this is Kof Dalet. Oh, if you want to see this, is Pasha Shishpatim, I should have said, where is Kof base And it's Pasha Kof Dalet. In Kof Dalet, it says the following thing. Ese oni imoch, uh, what does that mean? Uh, that is to say, let's find this. Um, it's only mark. Um, having mistakel but answer says Rashi. Rashi has lots of things to say here, but this is one of the things on this on this on this concept. Having mistakel but answer makosis ata oni. Imagine yourself as though you're the poor person. Conceive yourself as you're the poor person standing at the door. Mistakel because only if you see yourself. There's a mitzvah. There's a mitzvah. It's mentioned in Pirkei Avos. Nasa ba'alim kaveri. To carry somebody's burden as though it's your own. In order to, there's two words in, the, in English, empathy and sympathy. They both come from the Greek word pathos, meaning to feel. Sympathy means you feel sorry for him. Empathy means you feel as he feels or as she feels. You feel the person suffering. And you can only really do that ultimately if you've suffered like them. If you go to somebody for advice about some matter, some challenge that they're facing, and you face the same challenge and come through the other end, then you're obviously inspirational to the person. You inspire and you uh, uh, secure their confidence that if you could do it, maybe they could do it as well. Uh, but you've at least got to picture in your mind that it's you, it could be you. Picture yourself there and then you won't be so, oh, another guy collecting money for a yeshiva at the front door, number seven tonight. Just imagine she was standing out there in the snow, in the cold, trying to collect money. I've done this, incidentally, several times. It is one of the most painful and horrible things I've ever experienced. I'm hopeless at raising money and asking people for money. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you, because uh, you want to sponsor the share, the new email address is uh, uh, yy at askrabbiyy.com. Mm, you see how hopeless I am at it? I even forget to tell you where to, send, uh, to send money if you want the sponsorship. Anyway, but you've got to imagine you're the person actually making the request. Picture yourself as though you're there. Now, Rip Simka Zissel, the founder of Kelm, whom I mentioned before, who was the, the great uh, teacher of so many of, of the last generation, and in fact, so many of my teachers, including, of course, Rabbi Dessas, Tom Medium, uh, who were all... Uh, to meet him of mine. The very first thing he says in this classic work, Chochma uh, Musa, which is really is also a deeply philosophical work, but in Chochma Musa, the very first thing he has to say is on this: in order to fulfill the mitzvah, it's called Maimer Nachem Nemodim. In Elavol Lamalas Nois of Adam Chaveri, he says the first things he says, first page. In order to achieve the level of being able to feel somebody suffering. Yes, it's impossibility. Rag achroshi zragal harbe bahamas kaverim of ma'isa makshoba in a ma'isa goli. You've got to first love people. That's obvious, and you've got to be thinking about them a lot. But also, you've got to imagine the next bit. He's going to say, you've got to picture their situation, and as though, just as Rashi said, you are in it. And everybody knows there's a famous Gemara. The famous Gemara says, imagine or think. Um, about uh, a very interesting concept uh, that if somebody's sick and you go to visit the sick person, you take away a 60th, says the Gemara, of his illness. To which you might immediately think, as I thought when I first uh, came across this Gemara, aha, easy peasy, right? We'll cure everybody. Bring 60 people, one after the other. So if you bring a 60th of the illness, bring 60 people, not, and well, no illness left. But in actual fact, it's a reducing fraction. So it was mathematically minded. And so you would need a lot more than 60 people. But basically, if you take, if you bring 60 people, then apparently will make a, or, or anybody goes, takes away a 60, they also make an impact, it will reduce it to some degree. However, that famous Gomorrah, which quotes that, is often not quoted properly because the Gomorrah fully says that only a certain visitor, kind of visitor, a sick visitor, Will achieve that result visiting a sick person. If he's that person doing the visiting is what's called or designated as a ben giloi. Ben giloi. That is to say, says there are two commentators on the other side of the page, the Ram and Rashi there, and I can't remember which one says which, 
but it is one says it's a poor it's a poor person visiting a poor person or a rich person visiting a rich person. Rashi, I'm almost sure, says is somebody of the same age. So it's an old person visiting an old person or a young person visiting a young person. A young person visiting a young person. Um, immediately, when you're looking at somebody who was in kindergarten with you, in elementary school with you, and then maybe high school with you, or yeshiva, and there they're, they're on their, you know, effectively their deathbed or potential deathbed, what obvious thought is going through your mind? It could be me. So if it's a young person, then wow, that could be me. And that shocks the young person out of the young person's inevitable perspective. And I was guilty of this myself, that I will live forever, as all young people effectively think. You say to them, do you, do you really think that? No, they don't really think that intellectually, but really they do. Um, or an old person, they'll certainly think that. Or if it's a rich person, wow, a rich person with all the money in the world and access to the best doctors and stays had all those treatments and spent, you know, $3 million and nothing worked, that could be me, a poor person, etc. Why? Because they can picture themselves so easily. Uh, the formula goes like this. For whatever reason, heaven has decide, decided that the sick person needs X amount of suffering. But if you see yourself as this sick person, You've replicated him. You've been cloned effectively. You've psychologically, spiritually cloned yourself or attached yourself to him. Then by definition, you've sucked a 60th of that payment. Now, having made a decree, uh, an X amount of pain goes to that fellow. And now that you have become that fellow, because you see yourself as that fellow, as that fellow, then the definition, you've taken away some of the suffering, a 60th, and there's no longer that 60th to give him. Because, oh, he took away a 60th, I have to add some more on. No, no, the degree, the, the, the sentence was X amount of suffering. That's it. Somebody else took it. That's not your business. So it's got to be that you see yourself as being the same person. So let's go back to our previous question. Moshe, uh, uh, Rabino, and, and the Zikini, Menara, etc., they all go up to the mountain, and they see, or rather, I'm sure Moshe sees this, but certainly the other people see the picture of Hashem, and he's got this, he, he's underneath his feet, uh, they see this floor which is made of, of sapphire bricks. It's a picture. It's a picture. What picture is it? What message is it giving to the person who sees it? The idea is, says Rashi, in order to show you that when the, the Jewish people were in Egypt, Hashem had that there, as a reminder of these bricks, of the bricks that Jewish people had to make in order to um, be uh, to survive their slavery or to be beaten to death by the Egyptians. But the message of the prophetic imagery was to tell the Jewish people, the people seeing it, that if you want to help somebody in their pain, if you want to remember their pain, learn from Hashem, picture it have a picture there. So that's a general concept of um, this idea of leaving us a sap here, which comes up at the end of this week's Parsha. So before I get you to the al I've got to take you on a different journey still. We're not on the al yet. It's simply because the al which is only a few words incidentally this week, uh, the al is making some um, natural assumptions but being a complete master of the entire Talmud, you will have at your fingertips, unless you're called Rubinstein, uh, in which case you might need a little bit of help, which takes me, as I said, it would take me, to the Ma'ayin Beis HaSha'eva of Rav Shimon Schwab. And if you've ever seen any of my shirim, I very often refer to this uh, Rav Shimon Schwab because uh, I think it's absolutely fabulous. And this is the Pashas of a year old. This is a famous incident when Avram Avinu, is, well, I'll read this to you. And um, this is Vayero, it's Yudkas, chapter Yudkas in Genesis and, and Yudkimon. So what happens is that Avram is recovering from his bris mila and along come some angels. They're dressed like Arabs. They look like ordinary human beings. You would expect to find Arabs in Arab countries. And uh, they're dressed like Arabs, uh, but they're angels and Arab, uh, uh, Avram brings them in. And when he brings them in, um, he offers them food, which they only pretend to eat because they just can't actually digest very much. Um, and then, they, of course, they turn around and say, 
We're going to come back at, uh, and, and Sora, who is nearly 90 and has never had a child, is going to conceive. Sora hears this um, and laughs. And then Hashem says, why did Sora laugh? And Sora says, I didn't laugh. Now that itself is a whole share. I've got a whole share of the subject, but that's certainly the story. However, uh, certainly to give you the headlines, for Sora to have said that is bizarre indeed. If you misbehave in class behind the teacher's back, then the teacher might turn around and say, who did that? And you can deny it. He didn't see you. But Hashem sees everything. Oh, and he hears everything as well. So Sora did laugh. Hashem says, I heard her laugh. And she said, no, I didn't laugh. Hmm. Uh, I can't resist telling it. Rabbi Dessler, I think it's in page 162. It could be 126. In the fourth volume of Mita Belial, Fame is a wonderful essay there on this subject, says that when Sora said she didn't laugh, she was talking sincerely. She was saying, speaking sincerely. She laughed at the subconscious level. And Hashem heard her at the subconscious level. She was unaware of it. However, the point needs a little bit of elaboration. So let's uh, let Rav Shimon Shrab do the talking here. The Bereshish Rabbah, the Major Shrabbah says, Not once in, in history did God speak directly to a woman except Sora, this Tzedekas, this saintly woman, Sora. Hmm. Now, the Gomorrah famously says that there were w- women prophets, but apparently never spoke directly to them. Implication did speak directly to men, certainly spoke to Moshe, uh, certainly spoke to Aaron, but never to women directly, except on this one occasion. So if you're a superficial thinker, which of course nobody watching this year but is, but superficial people say, oh, that's it, you see, Judaism is, uh, is sexist and uh, chauvinist and uh, maleist, I keep adding all these crazy words, um, and discriminates against women. Listen. Um, and the story of Afhil al Eloi, and even in order to get her to speak to speak to her, it was only in response to her denying that she had laughed, which itself was to get her to make that denial, was itself engineered by God, because she didn't consciously laugh. Uh, so the whole thing was a trick to get her to to effectively subconsciously laugh. Kama kikrum kirachul kirkar, many, uh, as it were. Uh, almost I'm almost trying, tend to say tricks, but that's not quite the right word, but you get the idea. Manipulation might be a better translation. Translation: God manipulated in order to get her to actually do this. In order to be able to speak to her, so that she would turn around and say, no, I didn't, I didn't laugh. That's what the Medrash says. But sorry, beer, and that needs a lot of explanation, says Rav Shrav. So here he quotes the Gemara in Chulin, it's Nuntes on the base. And it says, Omer le kizel Rabbi Shua ben Hanina. So uh, there's many incidents in the Gemara of, of Caesar speaking to Rabbi Shua ben Hanina. And in this particular case, he said, I would like to see your God. Well, not a ridiculous request from uh, an idolater in those days, after all. Uh, they used to carry their gods around in their pockets, little statues, etc. So, Rabbi, Rabbi Hanina, let me see your God. To which he says, It's an impossibility to see him. I want to see him. And of course, if you're the most powerful man on the, on the planet, you're used to getting what you want. So I want to see him. And if you don't give Caesar what he wants, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, he might render unto you uh, the um, uh, omission of your head from this normal location. Uh, good. Uh, also, uh, 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 so he said, oh, okay. Right. If it is really so important to you, said Rav Hanina, Caesar, old boy, uh, then you've got to wait till the month of Thomas, which is August in the non-Jewish calendar. Um, and I can show you on then. That made perfect sense to Caesar. I mean, some gods only come out at certain times. I was, for some reason, listening to a BBC uh, um uh, documentary the other day, driving in my car, and there is a Hindu te- a, um, temple in in uh, in London. So they went, and the fellow was showing him around and explaining that you should come in the morning because the gods are asleep in the morning. 
That's when apparently people put out offerings, food for the gods to eat, which they never eat. And if they're asleep, you can't really expect them to eat. Uh, and at that point, you sort of like scratch your head. What? But in the idol in the world of idolatry, and Hinduism is as close as we get in the modern world to ancient idolatry, then gods um, reflected human behavior. They ate and they slept and, and did all this stuff as well, human stuff as well. So therefore, he says, wait till Thomas. You know, so the Jewish God, he's always, he hybrid. <laughs> he hybrid is. And you know, in the summer, he's wide awake. You want to see God? August is the time to catch him. Uh, Omerle is stuck in the day. So he takes him out in the month of Thomas. He says, have a look. And look at the sun. He says, what? He says, you want to see God? Look at the sun. He says, look at the sun. Be off your head. Um, if I look at the sun, I'll go blind. To which, Rabbi said to Caesar, well, if looking at one of his mere servants would let, render you blind, what do you think it would do if you looked at God himself? That was the point that was trying to be made. Now, this looks a little bit um, um, like, you know, Talmudic, you know, rabbinic sort of like cleverness, just uh, like, you know. A, a classic Talmudic story. However, there is um, uh, a lot of depth to this. And the depth is of this. First of all, Caesar didn't become Caesar, the greatest man in Rome. He was an idiot. He had to be extremely astute. Roman's education was extremely uh, advanced. Um, it may, they may not have the technology of today, but it's certainly the philosophy and the psychology of today. Even then, we call it psychology. And you know, people worked. Uh, and they, they knew how nature worked. So basically, when Caesar says to him, I want to see God, he's not an idiot. Uh, he, wants to, he means I want to see the essence of God. And Rokinina says that you can't see the essence of God, and that's the illustration he gives by looking at the sun. However, says Rishir um, Mishwab, uh, there is a way that you can see God. Uh, sorry, that's not true. Uh, there is, a, well, there is a way to see God, I suppose, if you get to love and watch your vena. But there is a way to see the sun, is what I'm trying to say without going blind. And that is if you use a glass, which is extremely uh, uh, darkened, a dark glass, stained glass, stained very, very heavily, so that it filters out the light and doesn't make you go blind. Now this, he says something very interesting. Because the basic nature of a woman, now we'll go back to how we started. It's only once Hashem spoke to a woman, that was the sword to say, no, you've lied. And she says, no, I didn't lie. The basic nature of a woman is to be a mokabellus, to accept the spiritual in a way that men don't. Men are fighters. Men want to make their own stamp. They've got a much greater sense of I than do women. That's natural. In my book, my new book, Truly Great Jewish Women uh, Then and Now, I pursue this through many, many stories, many, many uh, personalities to show why women are so much greater than men. Of course, Sora, as we know, was a greater Tzedekas, a greater Nevi'ah, prophetess, and Avril Lavina was a Novi. And the question is why? She was a woman. Why? Why is that automatically uh, uh, an advantage, spiritually speaking? The answer is obvious. Because women are babies. To decide to conceive a child is to decide to put yourself in profound danger, physical danger. Now, in this century, you almost never, Baruch Hashem, ever hear of a woman dying in childbirth. But before the century, it was very common. And in the Middle Ages, half of all births died. Uh, died before the age of five, that sort of stuff. Uh, so you're going to have a baby whom you're going to love, but you might well, 50% of them are going to have to say goodbye to them. That's a big deal. More than that, you're going to have to nurse those babies. Uh, and that means anything you want to do, you can't. The baby needs fed, you've got to sit down and, and nurse the baby. So therefore, it's there is the, the Yiddish word is an ibergi given kite. There is a, a film of a philanthropy, an altruism that has to be programmed into woman in order to accommodate a generation that comes from woman that doesn't apply to a man. So they're given a, a, a certain level of spiritual sophistication and um, uh, quality that men simply don't have. And when it comes to the spiritual, there's so much willing to accept the spiritual. Men don't. Men want to, as my wife cleverly says, 
men are fixers. We want to fix ourselves. But women, women naturally turn to Hashem. And you can see this very clearly. If you go to the Kotel, and at the Kotel, you see women davening, the cedar is always up on their face. They're davening, shocking very gently. Tears running down their cheeks, petitioning Hashem to change whatever horrible situation they found themselves in or their family in. Men, if you look at the camera, swings to the male side of the castle. They're like this, each one fighting, each one wrestling with God, as Yaakov did with the angel. Women are naturally in a higher level. So if God was to speak to a woman, because her nature is to accept too much, it would be too much. It would burn her up like the sunlight, unfiltered sunlight, looking at it would uh, scorch and, and damage and maybe blind uh, the eye of a human being. Therefore, you need a filter. In the case of Sora, to be able to speak to her, he has to get her to adopt effectively a male position, like the colored glass, which filters out, which pushes back against the rays of the sun. Then he, she has to turn around and legitimately, honestly say, I didn't. That's essentially to take a male position. That's the story. And that's what Shimon Shab says in my aim basis Shoeva. I think it's an absolutely fabulous safer, by the way. Good. And with that as an introduction, that we can come to the Alsha. So the Alsha is, if you remember, is concerned about these what was the sapir stuff that the, the the stones, the bricks underneath the Shem's feet was like the leaveness, the sapir. As blue uh, precious stone bricks, etc. What's that all about? We asked a couple of questions. Let me take you straight into the al and you'll see that he says something very, very important. And we'll conclude the share by going back to Ramat, uh, to Mr. Sharon with the commentary of Ramat Sil Solomon, which we started with. But let me read you the al After all, this is officially an al share. So he says, I get to read this bit to you. Achini, in Suffolk. Well, it's not the slightest doubt. When the Jewish people got to Mount Sinai and they look and they see a vision of God, the vision of God we talked about on his throne, under his feet, on the, on the ground, and it's, it's sapphire bricks. The American phrase says, duh, God doesn't have feet. He's not physical, not corporeal. There's no gravity that affects him. He's got to stand on on, on bricks or anything. I mean, you're called a happy that look at Israel. And who could possibly look at God? As we said before, we're only talking about the case of Sarah from a Shimon Shab of God speaking to her. But to look at God? So what's this talking about? They saw God. Nobody sees God and survives. Come on, Shah Rabbi Shua, the Kizer, as Rabbi Shua. I mean, as we said before, said to Caesar, that's why we had that bit. But Omar, I love, eh, eh, yeah, okay, cool. let me see your God. She said, the whole thing we've just explained. He showed him a little bit of the sunlight, and that would blind you. What do you think God would do to you? Okay. Imagine you actually saw God himself. Okay, now Omar, the year is the case of What does it say? The year is the case of I'm positive. We're, 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 we're uh, I don't actually think I started that, did I say that? Yeah, but got that. But here is how they get Israel, the Tachas Raglov, they saw the God of Israel and under his feet. We didn't do that. And under his feet was the, 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 the bricks made of sapphire. And so they've been in Israel. Good. So what does this mean? So it says, the year is how they get Israel. They saw the God of Israel. Well, you just said it's an absolute impossibility. What's the Torah talking about? They saw the God of Israel. When well, the Torah itself says you can't possibly see the God of Israel. Well, to tell all of it, but don't be upset by that. Don't think that's, that's, that's baffling. Kihalo Matakas Raglov. It says Takas Raglov. What was under his feet? Yeah, they saw God, but under his feet was a floor of sapphire bricks. Now think of a sapphire, a precious stone, but it's blue. Think of a diamond. The purest diamond is the clearest diamond and lets all the light through. But a blue diamond filters the light. But like a piece of glass, like the Gomorrah said and the Alshuk said, when he quoted that Gomorrah, it's got a dark blue filter. If you ever look at sapphire, it's a dark blue. It's a dark blue filter that filters out the light. So they wanted to see God, but under his feet. So they're looking up. After all, he's up there in heaven. So they see God, but they only see him through um, a, a floor, which is blue sapphire, which is filtering out the image they see. Otherwise, we kill them. 
But that's we're going to have more than that. Wuki hachal choshes kaich ros eni boser mehabit elas elspheres rav to stop physical eyes trying to look beyond what they can see. Sephiros. Now our word is sapphire. 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 Same in English, incidentally. Sapphire. Sapphire. Sapphirot, and we translate that as a sapphire. But sapphire means something else. Sephirot, it means counting, but it also means the spheres of the planes, the dimensions of holiness, which the Kabbalah is based on, the lead up to the to get into the holiness of Hashem, which is basically what Rapinka's Ben Yorav is saying at the beginning: level after level to get to the highest level. But if you try and get to the highest level too soon, you're in serious trouble. You need a filter. So therefore, to stop them trying to get beyond their ability to see beyond what they're capable of, capable of, of, of comprehending or containing, there's a filter, there's a floor, and the floor was sapphire bricks. This is absolutely brilliant, by the way. Um, they filtered it out so they weren't able to see properly. But if that's there, so that's like, as it were, the, like Moshe Rabbeinu had the veils, so that's the veil covering God. What was separating them? Maybe you could, they could see a little bit, a, a glimpse, and that would kill them. Just like if, you know, you, if you're holding that darkened glass and looking at the sun and you, it slips for a second, you'll see the actual light will burn you up. But maybe that's not enough to filter out God. So therefore, you didn't need one barrier, you needed a second barrier, a second veil. You need two, and it's, it's going up. So you need one, which is clear, and one which is even filtered, level after level. Something's not white. So it can stop the, the light coming through. So you get two filters. So you can, as I see, whatever you, whatever insight into the sephiras, the upper levels of existence, mystical existence, you'll get a glimpse, but it won't kill you. It won't destroy you. But then, remember, of course, that's what the Posik says. Now we look at the Alshik's eyes at the Posik. How did it say? The Yira is Eloke Yisro, but Takas Raglov can leave the Sasap here. So he says, What does that mean? The Yira is Eloke Yisro, so the Son of God of Israel. The Ech, Otsra, Kirk, Mohammed, Eloke. How could they do such a thing? The Omer, the answer is, Kihine, but Takas Raglov, Shnei Masechim. Under his feet, there was two veils, two barriers. Echod, Kamais, leave the Sasap here. One was like a barrier of a, of a glass floor, not a glass floor, but a sapphire glass floor to keep out the uh, ability to see beyond to levels which would kill them or destroy them. Who even is imperious, John Razal, as whatever that means, Kabbalistically. Um, because that's got that ability. It is, it, 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 um, Filters out the light. It's got this blue stain we talked about. But who ke'etzem hashemayim? And the apostle goes on to say that it was like ke'etzem hashemayim. She ain love and be'etzem rak ain tachlus shemes charez. And then after that, there was heaven itself, which is another barrier, which is blue-ish, but more whitish. But therefore, it was able to. So they looked up to heaven, looked through the the barrier of heaven, and then they had this glass floor which saved them from being destroyed by trying to reach to a level which was beyond them. That's the story of the love of the here. From a Musa perspective, we saw, it's a very important lesson. It, it, only if you can picture the suffering of somebody can you help somebody, but at a Kabbalistic level, which is what the Alshik's talking about, there's a very much more profound level. But let's return to where we started, which is Masil Shisharim, and the commentary of Ramatasil Solomon there, he says the following thing. Um, so he says, um, so he's talking about, here we're talking about, remember we talked about various levels for Pickles and Yor, and we got to this in chapter 29, and uh, 21 rather, he's talking about uh, the level of Chassidus, that's an incredibly high level, a Chosid, 
level of course it is higher than that of tzaddik. Okay, so it says, um, I was talking about a, a um, uh, talking about Hasidus, he says that, that sometimes a Hasid, uh, someone will read books about Hasidim, that means really holy people, not Hasidim the long payers uh, who follow a Rebbe, which may be Hasidim as well. But the classic um, um, designation of a Hasid is the one that is based on this book here, not that you're a Hasidic Jew. Um, anyway, call it a Maori Masekul Lisad Salasas or Masem Hana Hamadim. So here in the Masil Shorim, he's commenting on that it's very common that people will read stories of great Kosidim to be inspired by them. But Ramatisil Solomon, one of my great rabbis, he famously says, Let me read this to you. Medibi Rabbeinu, from what the Masil Shorim writes here in chapter 21, Nero Shemisha Aymed Bashkocha. But anybody who achieves and aspires to, to achieve a level of a chosid should read books about chosidim so that they can indeed be inspired and copy their behavior. But that is a huge mistake. But that's to say that people who've not reached the first level of Rapinkas Ben Yoyer that the book is based on, which being careful in mitzvahs, then so here's a shomim einu b'masik ke'ilu b'rotz lelech b'kubosa. But they know that the end of the process to get to maybe being a chosid and then somebody who's a kaddish and somebody's got ruach kaddish, so they start reading books about people who achieved that. But they only achieved that by going stage after stage after stage after stage, level after level. You mustn't look at the end and think that I'm going to get to that stage. Somebody is awarded a PhD, somebody in the audience, maybe a nephew, a great nephew, who just started, you know, high school. Then to walk onto the stage as well is ridiculous because you just started your high school education. This fellow spent 20, 30 years to get to the level to get that PhD. You can't just walk onto the stage. You can't just get a scroll, only if you deserve it. But that's a process that take 20 years. Similarly here. Uh, therefore, I feel that is here as a son of my enemy. But I say, but yes, I'm the Kobasa. But people who have not reached the first level, not conquered the first level, look at the first degree, are already looking at professorships at, at Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and Cambridge. Ach, in the Hasidus. But that's not Hasidus. Keep it shallow, I'll have a son of my dragons. That can't be considered Hasidus by reading about it just to want to copy a level you've never achieved, pretend you're a professor? That's nonsense. Why? Shalom, all of a sudden, because you didn't walk up the ladder, you didn't go through the process that takes you there. In Salvat Shachir, the Svit, the Sipurim. So the word Sipurim, again, we're reading stories, Sapir, Sapphire, Sephiris, that's the same word. But reading stories of my same end of the Koichim, La Oner, La Odom, the Shadow, La Hat, La Ider, Regna, Kazidus. But indeed, it's, it's wonderful to read stories of a great and holy people. They are indeed inspirational. But they should be inspiring to try to get to their level, but that can only be achieved by doing what they did to get to their level, stage after stage after stage. Try and go too far, you're in trouble. That's why there was a leaven as a sapphire. That's why there was a, a glass or a sapphire floor, so that the people looking up couldn't see it. They had the barrier of heaven, and then they had the barrier of the store, floor, because to do too much too soon, you'll destroy yourself. It has to be a process. You have to go over up stage by stage. That's a very pragmatic and, and maybe even mundane, but wise nonetheless piece of advice uh, as we come to the end of our al Shir here, uh, which the al Shir has pointed out in this week's Sedra. There's lots to learn there from this sapphire, uh, sapphire floor. Uh, but from a Hasidic point of view, from a mystical point of view, don't go and tr try to go too high. From a Muslim point of view, picture somebody else's suffering. Again, from just a common sense point of view, a sacral point of view, if you're trying to grow in Judaism, make sure you have a program. Make sure you have a teacher who is a professor, a rabbi, a Rosh Hashiva, a rabbi, who will take you stage after stage after stage so that eventually you can get to a level you can sustain Trying to get to a level before you can, not a good idea. And my sister likes to say, optimum, not maximum. 
Maximum you can sustain for a little while and then you're burned out. Optimum takes you. You finish, the difference is a 100 yard race, uh, and you do maximum and you're done. Or optimum, 26 and a quarter mile, the long haul. There's got to be stage after stage after stage. I hope you enjoyed that. I wish you a very, very good Shabbos. And again, I hope it's an Aliyah for Shlomo Zalman Ben Leo, uh, who's uh, your side of the 24th of Shabbat, I think it is. Okay. I wish you a good chance.